And welcome back. So we continue in our series of speaking to the big five parties as per representation in Parliament and looking at their manifestos and unpacking them. Now, the Freedom Front Plus was registered in March 1994, uh, just in time to contest South Africa's landmark elections on the 27th of April of that same year. Now, only one month old when South Africa went to the polls, uh, the Freedom Front Plus became the fourth biggest party in South Africa's first parliament and launching its manifesto on the 2nd of March in Centurion in Pretoria, the party promised to eradicate corruption, do away with cadre deployment and affirmative action, also to fix poor service delivery, as well as restore reliable electricity supply among its core pillars. The party says that after 30 years of the current government driving South Africa to the edge of ruin. The country needs a new dispensation. It also wants uh, recognition of group rights, uh, promoting independent communities, the restoration of identity and the protection of culture and diversity. Freedom Front Plus leader Dr. Peter Grunewald joins me here in studio to unpack the party's manifesto, which uh, was launched uh, two weeks ago now. Uh, thanks so much for your time, Dr. Grunewald. Welcome to Morning Live. Thank you, and thank you for the opportunity. So it was an interesting one in Pretoria at Heartfelt Arena, but uh, let me just uh, get a sense from you about the party, because I think when we started posting and looking at the demographic of uh, the representatives at the manifesto launch, many people were surprised at the number of black people at the Freedom Front Plus's manifesto launch. Has something happened in the meantime that South Africa perhaps has missed? I think what happened is that uh, we constantly said that we must empower communities. They must take control of their own communities when it comes to service delivery. And the other aspect of what uh, people said to me, specifically you're referring to black people, is said that that and also the values we portray to say that we must bring back a respect uh, in politics in South Africa, integrity, uh, hard-working people, all those uh, values, actually conservative values. And that's why political analysts put us in the center right as a conservative party with conservative values, which benefit South Africa. And that's why they're coming. Uh, people actually thought uh, that the Freedom Front Plus is only for whites. Our constitution says that uh, any South African citizen who uh, agrees with our principles and our policies can become a member. And therefore, we have, for instance, councillors. Uh, we have a black councillor, we have uh, many brown councillors uh, with the last 21 election. And therefore, people are realizing that uh, that is what we need in South Africa to restore and rebuild South Africa. So that, of course, at the core of what you stand for, uh, you know, identity, um, politics, uh, as you say, uh, the right to self-determination, etc. How do you fuse those, though, across the racial divide in South Africa? Because race is an issue in South Africa. Um, how do you find that your traditional membership base uh, actually uh, reconciles having members of other groupings within the Freedom Front Plus? It reconciles because they also understand that if we talk about self-determination, it also includes communities uh, that can have all races. Uh, and therefore, in the end, it is that you can take control you can ensure that those issues that are important for your and your community, uh, those issues can be dealt with by ourselves. Let's take language, for instance. Uh, uh, that's why we also have quite uh, support from the brown people, because the mother tongue is also Afrikaans. Uh, ironically, people think it's only, or the majority of Afrikaans-speaking people uh, is actually white people. It's wrong. Mm. It's brown people. Uh, therefore, it's going over those boundaries, if I can say, if you look at the past. And people say, yes, we can work together. You know, the preamble of South Africa's constitution determines uh, strength in our unity and unity in our diversity. And that, we know, is going to be the winning 
aspect uh, to build a South Africa again. It's not about what color you are when you want a job. It is about merit. We need the best people, irrespective of race, to come forward and to use those people to rebuild South Africa. And people are realizing that we must take hands. And that is why the fact that we can take hands, uh, we respect each other. We respect our different cultures. And uh, with our launch of our manifesto, for instance, uh, the manifesto was in all 11 uh, written uh, official languages, as well as a sign language uh, that was broadcasted. And then also Braille for our uh, people, for our blind people. And that is actually not a fact that we only talk and speak about respect. We also do what we say. And the, it's those actions and the fact that in Parliament people see that the Freedom Front Plus comes forward. Yes, we are criticizing the government, but we're also coming forward with solutions. And I think that is what people want to see. Uh, if, for instance, we say that uh, we do not uh, accept a black economic empowerment or affirmative action, we say that black economic empowerment did not empower they were really poor and the masses of South Africa. It only enriched the elite who had the correct political connections. And you know where I come? Uh, black people come to me and they say, uh, Dr. Grunewald, that's exactly what uh, happened with black economic empowerment. Uh, it's the same with affirmative action. Uh, if you go and look, for instance, our students uh, at universities, I think uh, about two years ago, they were more than three times more black students graduating than, for instance, white students. Uh, and therefore, uh, in the labor market, you have a big pool of black qualified graduates, uh, talented people. And we say that we must do away with affirmative action in this sense, that we must actually unlock the potential of our people in South Africa, all the people, not only specific people. Okay. To that point, um, going back to black economic empowerment and broad-based black economic empowerment in what the name or the term suggests, do you acknowledge that there has to be a greater empowerment of black people in the South African economy? We say there can be empowerment, but then it must be through skills development. Uh, let me give you a good example. Uh, when we talk about land reform, uh, we had the mentors in agriculture where they assisted with land reform and upcoming farmers, commercial farmers. And therefore we say, actually, we must see how we can uh, use and the, the skills transfer to business people, uh, to everyone who can uplift and build the economy, because that is what we need. And what I always say to people, because I say, yeah, but for, before 94, uh, the people were disadvantaged. Mm -hmm. The fact of the matter is, it's 30 years down the line. And I've used the example for three times more black students graduating. So we said from the start, you will go have a natural process for where you can get the best people uh, in South Africa and graduate. So we say that in itself, you must open your universities. That is to ensure that the disadvantaged people in the previous dispensation had the opportunity to study, for instance, I okay, but the studying part is perhaps the easier part to address. I think it's uh, the inequality and the redress that needed to happen uh, through a broad-based black economic empowerment and affirmative action, which I think many South Africans will acknowledge did not happen. But the fact that the policy perhaps did not pan out as it should have, where it, is, where it was not as broad-based in its uh, benefit to the broader South African public, does that mean that we now just sweep past it because it's 30 years later, it didn't quite do what it set out to do? 
and we forget about it and we move on? Or should there be a concerted effort to still try and apply redress, still try and um, level the playing field, so to speak, which you will never do, by the way, but at least make an attempt, broadly speaking, to try and, um, you know, give more South Africans an opportunity which they wouldn't have had pre-94 in order to, again, try and level the, lay, uh, the, the playing field somewhat. Should we not be focusing on perhaps getting right what we failed to do in the last 30 years in that regard? I think the redress, uh, even in the workforce as such, because of the availability of people who can do the job, you must always remember, in business, for instance, uh, people want uh, people who can do the job. Uh, they must be qualified to do that. And if they go to the labour market and see who is available, you go get the majority is actually already black. And therefore, it's just logic that the majority of the workforce in that sense will come from the black pool, if I can use that, if we want to talk about black and white. Uh, and therefore, we say that uh, it must be based on merit. I spoke to many black people, uh, also women, uh, because pe uh, people also say that we must uh, empower the women. Uh, how do you empower women? You empower them, and what is equal treatment with women? On merit, because I think uh, it is actually, uh, if you say to a woman or to black people, I'm going to put you in a position just because you're a woman uh, and uh, because you are black, in a certain sense is disrespectful uh, towards the abilities of that specific person because I believe they all have that good abilities mm. and potential that we can use. But, but the, 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 the core of the matter is, if you go into the labor market and you want to choose people to work in your company, uh, the majority of that uh, possible uh, work force is from the black uh, people in that pool. So uh, it reminds me of uh, uh, the release of the Employment Equity Report about uh, workplace representation. And I remember a few years back, one of the analysts saying that uh, white women have now become honorary white men in the workplace by virtue of the fact that they are overrepresented when you are uh, looking at the employment equity and what should be happening in terms of employment. When it comes to the management level, higher management level, white women and Indian women were overrepresented, whereas black and colored women, for example, remain lagging. So again, another example of how what is supposed to be a matter of redress isn't quite happening. Does that then mean we move along or do we make a concerted effort as a nation to actually address and right these wrongs? Now, what I say as far as that is concerned, yes, if you go up to your higher positions, as you have mentioned, uh, but then we must uh, see in which way we can address that, but not based on race. It must be on merit. Again, uh, you must remember one thing. Uh, we must also ensure that we have investments, foreign investment, people coming invest in South Africa. And the first thing, uh, if you tell them that you have to have certain quotas, that you have uh, to have affirmative action, uh, of black economic empowerment, they're not interested. Because they are not philanthropic, Dr. Khrunavar. Say again? Uh, investors are not philanthropic by their nature. They come here because there's money to be made and they will invest because they are investing. Regardless of what they say, they're still investing because there's money to be made. Yep, but they don't invest enough so that we can create jobs. That's a problem. Uh, Is that a matter of investment? Because if that's the case, South African businesses themselves are not investing in this economy. Well, you're quite correct in a certain sense, because they want to expand their businesses. Uh, but there are many factors because of not expanding. Uh, and that comes in where we say we must uh, ensure that we rebuild and uh, enhance the economy. Uh, which these, black economic empowerment and affirmative uh, action is only one aspect of it. Well, there are many other aspects. Uh, for instance, if you look at the electricity situation in South Africa, that is a problem. If we look at uh, labor laws in South Africa, that is an issue. 
when we want to expand uh, business, local businesses as well as foreign investment. If I talk about investment, I'm talking about foreign investors creating jobs by means of putting up factories uh, and everything like that. I don't talk about financial investments. I'm talking about investments so that we can create jobs because the biggest enemy of South Africa is the unemployment rate in South Africa. We must ensure that people get jobs. And we've spoke about the black economic empowerment mm. and affirmative action again. And I say again, and you know, there's one thing that about two years ago, Statistics South Africa, uh, they made a study and they found that about two years ago, more black professionals are leaving South Africa than white professionals. And then we must ask ourselves why. Uh, and uh, I spoke to an engineer in uh, ESCOM, for instance, and he said, uh, I am the engineer. I have to take the responsibility for certain operations. But my manager, he is an affirmative action uh, appointment. He is not an engineer, but he tells me what to do. And that's why I'm leaving South Africa. All right, let's park it there because I want to come back and talk more, Eskom. Uh, Dr. Peter Grunewald, the leader of the Freedom Front Plus, our guest this morning, talking about their manifesto launch for 2024 and unpacking that manifesto. Do stay with us and send us your questions. That's our question of the day. If you have any questions for Dr. Peter Grunewald at Morning Live SABC, and we'll continue the conversation right after this. Welcome back. It's election season. Of course, the top five here on Morning Live, uh, that's the four, top five political parties unpacking their election manifestos with us. And this morning, it's the turn of the Freedom Front Plus and their uh, leader, Dr. Peter Grunewald, in studio with me. Uh, Dr. Grunewald, uh, let's just take a quick look at some of the uh, messages coming through from our viewers. This one's from Rikesh. says, how is the manifesto of the Freedom Front Plus different from the DA and what makes it attractive to the masses? I think the difference is that we are not making promises. Uh, we are not promising two million jobs. We are putting forward a plan which we say that if we follow these building blocks, then we will create a better South Africa. And part of that is rebuilding the economy so that we can create jobs. Uh, politicians must stop to just making promises. We also differ from the Freedom, uh, the Freedom Front Plus differs uh, from the DA and also certain aspects such, for instance, abortion. Uh, they have open votes on that. We are against ab abortion except where the woman's life is in danger or in the case of rape. So there are smaller issues where we do differ with other political parties, in this specific case also the Democratic Alliance. All right. Uh, this one's from Sichaba. Sichaba says, uh, morning team, each and every political party needs to change South Africans' lives. The likes of poverty, job opportunities, crime and reduction of load shedding. Freedom Front Plus needs to work harder to win our hearts. Yeah. And that's an interesting one. I think when we talk about winning our hearts, in our manifesto, of course, we address each one of those issues. And we are coming forward of how we think that we can fix it. But part of that, if it is about the hearts of the people, we say in the end, we can have whatever plans to do, but we must have those values of respect, the values of integrity, the values of uh, trustworthiness, uh, honesty, because even if you're a civil servant, if you have those values, then, for instance, you will curb corruption uh, in South Africa. Uh, crime will be less. And then you will be focused on what you are doing. It's a service delivery to the people of South Africa. It's not only that I have a job and I want to have a salary by the end of the month. If you have those values and you do your job driven by those values, I think, then the people will understand and then you will get the hearts of the people. Yes, we all have uh, solutions to these specific uh, issues. 
And I think that is the difference. So I found that very interesting because, you know, you, you spent quite a bit of time talking about uh, the fact that we need values as a society uh, during your manifesto launch. And if we look at the most basic building block of any society, it is the family unit. Um, and in that regard, in South Africa, we seem to be struggling on that front. So what would the Freedom Front Plus do in order to try and get us back on a positive trajectory in that regard? Well, firstly, you must look at the socioeconomic situation in South Africa. People are poor. Uh, but that doesn't mean that if you're poor, you don't uh, need these values. I th sometimes think that you need it even more. But what we must do is that we must also look at the criminal justice system. And it sounds very strange if I say the criminal justice system. I use that for an example because I say the problem in South Africa is impunity. People are just getting away, for instance, with crime. And that goes down also to the families, where the family is, the, as you said, the, the first building block. Uh, parents have to work to economically survive. And therefore, there's not enough time spending towards our children. Uh, let's take modern technology, for instance. You know, I sat in a restaurant where the father, the mother, and the four, five-year-old boy, each one uh, are on their uh, cell phones. Uh, and the little girl, she was about three years old, she actually pushed between the mother and her cell phone just to get attention. Uh, so we must get that balance back. We, we, the parents, if you specifically use the example of family, give enough attention to the children. Uh, we must have discipline. Uh, and then we create those values. For instance, if we take domestic violence in South Africa, it's a huge problem. What example uh, do the men set? Uh, in South Africa when we talk about uh, domestic violence. Uh, and if we look at those issues and we can address it, address it for instance, uh, if we talk about uh, violence against women and children, there's an increase. Why? What are we doing about it? It's no use just talking about it. We must create practical uh, situations, for instance, when it comes to domestic uh, violence, it must be actually a priority. Safe houses. But we must not just say they are safe houses, we must create those safe houses. And that's part of a building uh, situation. The same with our educational system. Uh, we will have to ensure that we get more discipline in all those institutions to rebuild South Africa, and specifically when it comes to the violence. And, and, and you speak in your manifesto about promoting mother tongue education. So I want to talk about that, whether your emphasis is purely on Afrikaans uh, or whether there is a broader concern there of mother, the mother tongue education universally in South Africa. No, it's a broader universality matter. I mean, if you take our other indigenous languages in South Africa, uh, I think uh, there's an injustice against them. It's not just about Afrikaans. Uh, and I've used the example of our manifesto available in all the languages. Uh, I think we are neglecting specifically other indigenous languages uh, and mother tongue education. Uh, for instance, the largest group in South Africa uh, is Zulu, uh, then Kosa, then Afrikaans, uh, and then comes uh, um, Tetswana, uh, and then fifth, is actually English, but we are actually using English in everything. It's not only in our schools a mother tongue, and it is internationally proven that children receiving education, specifically if we talk at school level, uh, in their mother tongue language, they are better uh, in the results in the end. That's an international acceptance mm. uh, uh, matter. Therefore, we say, all languages, even if you go to our universities. Uh, we said, for instance, that uh, let's take Afrikaans. There's not one single university in South Africa that's predominantly or dominantly uh, Afrikaans, although there are 38 campuses 
uh, everything is actually becoming English. If you go to a, a state department, if you go, for instance, to home affairs, everything is about English. Uh, we must, if we say that we have 11 official languages, actually 12 with sign language, then we must practice what we preach. So speaking about practicing what we preach, would the Freedom Front Plus then um, go on to ensure the development of other indigenous languages in South Africa to the level of, say, in English and Afrikaans, so that you For can sure. go right from preschool to tertiary where you can study in your language? For sure. Uh, the other day, about a year ago, I heard about the first uh, PhD uh, I think it was in uh, Fort Hare, uh, of a Zulu PhD. I was very excited about that because that's what we want. And yes, we will ensure that we promote that. Uh, that's the only way. Perhaps uh, more than promote. There needs to be a concerted effort to yeah. actually make sure that these languages <clears throat> develop. That yes. it's not just spoken, but it's written and, and, and right up to academic level um, at tertiary where the language is developed to the extent whereby you can go through your entire life being able to receive instruction That's in right. that language. And an assertive effort is also if you go to your state departments, people must be uh, in a position where they can use their mother tongue language if they want to research services. So if you're in government, you can enforce that to ensure that it is available for the people if they want to be served in their mother tongue language. Especially also the tertiary institutions, as you say. Mm. Uh, I think uh, they should. And I said there are 38 campuses. Uh, so in 38 campuses, we are, have 11 written official languages. Why don't we have campuses who are dominantly in those specific languages. It is possible. Mm. So for those who are concerned that the Freedom Front Plus may take us back to the apartheid days so that if the Freedom Front Plus uh, gets back to being perhaps the government of the day one day that uh, all instruction or learning and teaching will happen in Afrikaans once again. Um, well, what do you say to that? Uh, apartheid is dead. And in the Freedom Front Plus, I always say we must stop fighting for the better past. We must fighting for a better future. Uh, nobody wants to go back to apartheid. Uh, we have to take hands in South Africa. That's what our constitution says. Uh, it actually honor those who built South Africa. All races, not only white or black or anything. And now we say in the Freedom Front Plus, now let's honor the past by building a better future now for ourselves and our children for the future. And we must take hands. Uh, mm -hmm. And we can do that. And therefore, nobody wants to go, want to go back to apartheid. The Freedom Front Plus, because of the respect, will ensure that all the languages uh, will be respected. All people in South Africa will be equal. That's why we say, do away with black economic empowerment. Do away with affirmative action. Let us all be equal. You can do have, for instance, a, a test in terms of socioeconomic factors, because you get poor people who are black, white, Indian colors, it doesn't matter. And that should be a criteria. For instance, if you want to give bursaries uh, for people uh, at our universities, not whether you're black, white, or that sort of thing. In fact, I said it before, I th said that if you want to go and study uh, medicine, for instance, uh, white students have to have a certain score point of 80. Uh, Indian people about 78 or 75, brown people 70, uh, black people 65. I think uh, that is actually nothing else uh, than disrespectful. Because do you think that black people, for instance, are weaker than white people? Uh, it's a disgrace to have that, as far as my view is concerned. We are all equal. Say, if you want to study medicine or become a medical doctor of medicine, uh, then this is the requirements, mm -hmm. irrespective of who you are. You know, there was an advertisement in uh, Etiquini where the municipality advertised uh, an auction of the second-hand vehicles. And in the newspaper, it explicitly said white, brown and Indian people 
are not allowed to tender for that auction. Now, that is blatant racism. Uh, and that's why we come back where the Freedom Front Plus also say that somebody must stand up for the minority people and groups in South Africa. Mm. And uh, that is part of our policy to say that we must protect the interest of minority people in South Africa as well. So the land question is obviously one that's um, a very important uh, to the Freedom Front Plus and its constituency. Talk to us about a, ra a land redistribution and again, the question of redress as far as the land question is concerned, given what we know about South Africa and uh, the land dispossession of black people. What is your position on that? And especially uh, uh, expropriation without compensation. How do we move forward as a country on the land question? Well, firstly, we must remember that, that we had a land restitution in South Africa. Land reform consists of land restitution. That is where people up till uh, December 1998 could have put in their claims for land. And that was connected with the 1913 Land Acts where people were forcefully removed. So there was restitution for that. There was about 80,000 claims, and I think there's about two or 3,000 claims still outstanding. So we say that that was redressed. And the interesting fact of that is that about 94% of the claimants didn't want the land. They want the money. Uh, that is the compensa uh, compensation they wanted. If you take the other part, land reform as such, then the projects, uh, the government went on land reform, 90% of them were failures. And that's not what the Freedom Front Plus says, it's in the annual reports of the Department of Land Reform. 90% failures. Now, the Freedom Front Plus says, there's enough land in South Africa. Firstly, we must look at those failures and turn it around to say that we can make a success. And it is important because it has an effect on food security in South Africa. And previously I referred for instance uh, for mentorships. But with that, we must have a land bank who can assist with upcoming farmers uh, so that we do not uh, endanger food security in South Africa. So they can use those land. If we go, for instance, to state land, uh, there are millions of hectares which the government owns. They can avail those land uh, for land reform. When it comes to expropriation without compensation, we are totally against that. We say it should be willing buyer, willing seller. And a couple of years ago, we had a severe drought in South Africa. I said it in Parliament. The government could have grabbed good farms for really good prices on the principle of willing buyer, willing seller. They always say, but that is hampering uh, land reform. It's not true. What is hampering uh, land reform is corruption in that department and the lack of financial support. You can't just get and give land to a farmer, a black farmer, and say, now you're going to farm. There must be assistance, and there was, and still is. Are you saying the land bank isn't doing that at the moment? No, not properly. They don't do it properly. Uh, but it is not only only for that. Land bank is there to support the whole agricultural uh, sector. For instance, if there is a disaster like a drought, they should uh, give, uh, say, uh, interest-free loans for that specific or a specific period which they don't do. At one stage, we had a big problem with the land bank. So we must, with corruption. So we have to sort that out, that it functions correctly and what it is meant for. So the government who comes and says, no, but uh, it's not expropriation without compensation. It's with uh, zero value. And I said, if the government think that people are stupid and if they are stupid, we are not. Because there's no difference with uh, zero uh, compensation and expropriation with compensation. We can build South Africa. As I said, the land is there. Let's take, for instance, people say, 
uh, that uh, there is uh, illa uh, uh, illegal uh, land evasion because there's not mm. land available for housing. There is land available, but it must be done ordinarily because you have a planning department in each and every municipality. And the Freedom Front Plus says, first put in the sanitation and the water infrastructure. If you have that, then you can bring in the pe uh, people. Mm. To, but now they do it the, the other way around. And it is chaos. It's not fair in a certain sense to those people illegally invading uh, the land because uh, well, they don't have water, they don't have sanitation. We must bring back proper planning. The land is there. All right. And then and I'm, I'm looking forward to having debates with different parties on all of the issues that you are unpacking here this morning. I want to hear your stance as the Freedom Front Plus on the Gaza situation, what's happening with Palestine and Israel. I said it before that we must remember that the aggressor in this situation was Hamas. They were the aggressor. And we are in favor of the two state solution. But when we say that, we must remember, if we say that Palestine can become a separate uh, land, we must also recognize it for the right of Israel. It's as simple as that. So we Israel has said that they do not see a two-state solution. And also when you say Hamas is the aggressor, you mean Hamas was the aggressor on October 7th? Yes. This occupation has been going on for over seven decades. So what exactly do you mean by they are the aggressor? Well, I talk about specifically the 7th of October, the attack. There are ways to solve and get other solutions. We are in favour of that there should be diplomatic solutions for the situation. And make no mistake, I also said that the real victims in any war are actually the women and the children. And that is what is happening. Uh, we can also go to the Ukraine situation, uh, where the aggressor was... Uh, Russia. And I always say when it uh, is, we're talking about war, the aggressor is also and is always on the wrong side. There are other ways to solve a problem. You say that Israel, that's what they are saying now. Uh, we say that we are in favor of a two state solution. And Israel at one stage was in favor of that. Then they must go back to that and they must see how they can solve it. But the fact of the matter is, if you say that you want to become an independent state, then also recognize the independence of Israel. And there are, or the, the leaders of Hamas says, quite also frankly, that Israel must be destroyed. So if we use what people and leaders are saying, it's on both sides. Uh, the Israelis didn't say that we must destroy uh, Palestine. Mm. Uh, they well, said, well, they, what did they mean by from the river to the sea? Uh, no, they, they, their enemy is Hamas. And you must remember Hamas is uh, actually uh, internationally known as a terrorist organization within Palestine. Okay. Um, I quickly want to touch on the DA and writing to the United States Embassy in South Africa and also the U.S. Secretary of State. So in their letter to the U.S. Embassy here in Pretoria, uh, they mentioned the multi-party charter. So I would imagine you had a discussion as the multi-party charter about inviting the United States uh, to come and observe Yes. These elections, why, yes. why do you feel there's a need to explicitly invite the United States government when you are saying that you don't want foreign interference from elsewhere, whereas it seems like you are inviting another foreign entity okay. into the fold? There's a difference between interference and observation. Uh, they're not going to interfere with the election. We are worried about interference. You must remember that President Ramaphosa said that they have a secret weapon. Uh, for the election. Uh, they will win the election. What does he mean by that? And we are asking him, now what are you meaning by that? That creates suspicion. And uh, of course, the SADC... What suspicion? Uh, are you suspecting that the ANC will rig the vote? It's possible, of course. And I can give you examples. For instance, in previous elections, uh, where, for instance, I said there were no votes for the Freedom Front Plus. And we knew that we had people there and we queried it, and then they apologized. And okay. so, sorry. So, and there are numerous mistakes like that. Uh, but I mean, 
uh, SADC uh, countries are going to be observers. They always are. Uh, it doesn't matter what we say, that don't, let's just have SADC. The, the question is, why uh, does uh, the government have a problem? But with nobody other has observers. ever stopped any other observers. Say again? Nobody has stopped any other observers exactly. ever. Okay, 15 seconds. Why should people vote for the Freedom Front Plus? They should vote for the Freedom Front Plus because we have workable solutions. And we say that we must rebuild South Africa. Because if we want a future where we have peace, prosperity uh, for our children, then we must rebuild South Africa. All right, we have to leave it there. Dr. Peter Grunewald, thank you so much.